Christopher Fairley is Professor of Sexual Health at the University of Melbourne and also Director of the Melbourne Sexual Health Centre. He also edits the journal Sexual Health, which is one of the main titles from CSIRO Publishing. Christopher, thanks very much for being with us today. It's my pleasure. I guess um, one of the first questions I'd like to ask is what's sexual health all about? I mean, I think there's this popular feeling that it's just to do with sexually transmitted infections, but does it have a broader parameter than that? Absolutely. So there's actually a world health definition of what sexual health is, and it's well-being in relation to physical, psychological and cultural social characteristics of sex. So it's a very broad area. My role here at the centre is to do my best to create an environment where people can have sex in a community with a low prevalence of sexually transmitted infections, so keeping STD rates low. But sexual health is a lot more than that. It's about providing adequate contraception for women. It's about providing access to condoms. It's about sufficient information and education through schools. It's about creating laws and environment where people can express their sexuality with complete freedom. So it's about progressing same-sex marriage until those relationships have the same level of acceptance that heterosexual relationships have. And we're doing quite well in Australia in some ways and we're doing very badly in others. And so um, sexual health is an all-encompassing term and I'm really just responsible for the control of sexually transmitted infections but it has many other aspects to it. So what are some of the popular kind of misconceptions that you um, come across in your day-to-day -day work? So one of them is uh, why has someone got a sexually transmitted infection? So people think that the reason that someone has a sexually transmitted infection is because they are personally responsible and are individually weak to have got it. But it's much, it's much more than that. It's an environment, it's creating an environment where the prevalence of sexually transmitted diseases is low. It's creating an environment where they can get access to health care free of charge. It's creating an environment where they can get access to condoms and contraceptions and so forth. So people think it's an individual's fault that they have got something, a sexually transmitted infection, teenage pregnancy or whatever. But actually, it's largely the responsibility of the community that those things have have occurred. So people have got to get out of the context of blaming individuals and doing things that the community can do to create an environment where all those things are low. So presumably good sexual health um, within society starts with uh, appropriate and good sexual health education. How are we serving our children in this matter, whether it's within uh, the school or at home? Is this something that we're achieving the kind of goals that we should be aspiring to? So Australia doesn't sit very well in relation to sex education in schools. So some countries, particularly the Nordic countries and Northern European countries like the Netherlands, for example, are doing quite well. So the measures that you could use for that is the rate of teenage pregnancy, which unfortunately in Australia is really relatively high. And what has to happen, I think, is the community attitude to sex education has to change. It's really not appropriate for a child to leave school with a TER score of 99 point something or other and not know where they can find condoms how the pill, contraceptive pill is used, how to have a respectful relationship and how to get access to treatment if they need to. And so there's a whole series of things that we don't do very well in sex education and they're not going to happen by a school suddenly teaching it because the parents will object. It's our role as professionals and government and so forth to educate the parents about how much better kids do when they leave school or enter sexuality, which is before they leave school, with a, a full box of tricks that they can address the issue of their new sexuality. So if um, we aren't seeing everything that we should see within schools at the moment, then presumably we're not seeing it at home either. Is, is there a problem with the way that sexual health is being framed within the home? I, I don't know about how well it's being framed in home and it'll vary from one community to a now that generally speaking, the more conservative the views, the worse it's done. So you might find that it's done better in Brunswick and Carlton and so forth than you would find in some of the more conservative s suburbs. And of course, 
the, the home reflects the school. A number of private schools have really terrible sex education programs and others have very good ones. In general probably the best ones exist within some of the government schools but there's certainly private schools where the programs are uh, essentially negligent. So what are some of the different types of sexual health issues that emerge as people pass through different life stages? Well I think that it begins of course with young people having adequate confidence in education to begin a effective sexual relationship and, and so I think a lot of that's about education. People have to learn about respectful relationships, they have to learn about how to communicate with one another, to express what they want, what they don't want and so forth. Then there's a whole lot of physiological things because men and women operate differently, they get aroused differently, they reach orgasm differently and so all those sort of things are part of the issues that if not done well and so forth um, can impede someone's overall sexual health. And then once they start to have partners, of course, pregnancy, teenage pregnancy is a very important issue in Australia. We do that badly. Access to contraception is not ideal. Sexually transmitted infections in general in Australia are relatively low and particularly with the human papillomavirus vaccine that's available to girls and will be available to all boys next year, we're seeing huge reductions in genital warts. And then as the relationships develop into the 20s and 30s, I think that the fundamental issue is training people how to be nice. How to just be simply nice to one another. As our rate of relationships break down, particularly if there's young children involved, is too high. And I think formal education for mathematics and English grammar is appropriate. I also think some form of formal education about relationships is also important. And then there's the issue as people get older. Sexuality shouldn't stop just because people get older, even a lot older. And now there are a number of different uh, medications that are available that can assist people, for example, who have severe vascular disease to maintain erections. And also there's ones, medications available for women that use in appropriate settings are useful. I think that overall, we're not very good at teaching people about sexual function. And so it's all right in some ways for men having sex with men or women having sex with women because they understand each other's bodies because they've got the same sex. I think the bigger problem comes with heterosexuals where you've really got to teach men and women that they're, they're different, the way they get aroused, the way they reach orgasm is all different and so that's probably something over a continuum and of course it changes as people get older as well so <clears throat> there's a there's a whole lot of different issues that appear in different age groups what are some of the differences that men and women face when it comes to sexual health matters are there certain things that are a, more of a challenge to one than the other uh, yeah, yeah I think there are there are differences if we just step one back one step there's no doubt that one of the things that's fundamental for well-being, and I don't actually mean sexual well-being, I mean well-being in general, is a fulfilling, long-term, intimate, personal relationship. And part of that is uh, men and women's sexual health in a long-term relationship as well. And very few men are given appropriate education at how to have sex with a woman and vice versa women aren't well educated about men either and so um, as for, for women the issue is that because men don't know they tend to have trouble reaching orgasm they have tend to have trouble getting aroused sometimes and and for men because they don't know how women function they tend to have trouble with premature ejaculation particularly young women sorry young men tend to have trouble with premature ejaculation and so that the, the, the sexual act can sometimes be rather disheartening for for both sides so that comes down to the issue of appropriately educating young people at the beginning because there are unfortunately still a lot of people going through life who haven't quite worked out how it all works because communication about very intimate sexual feelings and thoughts are not easy between couples and some formal training uh, at 
would, would assist with that whole process. There's, there's also a couple of other things. I think men are not trained well to communicate, even though the data shows overwhelmingly that long-term relationships are a very important part of an overall well-being. Men tend to be a bit blokey and so forth, and, and women like to chat more, and I think men have to learn how to communicate better, and women have to learn how to train those men in a way to communicate better. And I think the stereotypes that we see in, if I could uh, have a go at Australian rules football and violence, for example, is completely inappropriate and reflects on the community as, as a whole. The scenes we see where that violence occur will, ref will flow on to the community as, as a whole. What influence does someone's sexuality have in terms of their sexual health? Are there different experiences, for example, between um, the challenges of promoting sexual health to straight communities as opposed to gay communities? I think there's a big difference between straight communities and gay communities. I, I feel very strongly that society in this area is still relatively immature. People who are gay at school are ridiculed, they have a high rate of suicide, their relationships don't last as long. There's a whole lot of pressures on same-sex relationships that make it much more difficult for those relationships to succeed. If I can just read you one sentence from an article recently published with the International AIDS Conference in 2012. It's on Obama marriage, equality and the health of gay men. And this writer says, as a young man in my early 20s, witnessing the devastation of the AIDS epidemic in my community, I noted to a friend one night, if gay men were allowed to be married, this disease would go away. I think that says it all. It's much hard in a same-sex relationship to maintain an ongoing relationship, but that's ultimately how you control sexually transmitted infections, because you have long-term relationships without partner change, and infections are not transmitted. So while large groups of the community still are in kindergarten in their thought processes in relation to these things, there will be huge material benefits to the community as a whole that occur when the community matures sufficiently to accept the concept of same-sex relationships having equality. So what about um, straight communities? Are, are there particular challenges that um, take place within straight communities? For example, I once um, read that there are some people who are, are ostensibly straight, some men who are ostensibly straight, but nevertheless have sex with other men that don't really perceive themselves to be gay. And there can be a challenge to figure out how to kind of communicate um, to the particular type of experiences of that person. So the issue of same-sex attraction, people think, oh, I'm gay or I'm straight. It's not that simple. It's a continuum over time. And many people, young people at school or early university, will experiment a bit and work out if that's something they like or if that's something they don't. It's terribly important that we accept whatever someone is as they are, as that's OK. If you look at countries where same-sex relationships are not accepted, what you see is a lot of married men having sex with women, their, their regular partner, and men. So you get a lot more disease transmission in those communities than you get in countries that li like Australia, which is relatively advanced, but still a long way off an acceptable level of same-sex equality. So, so people should be allowed to experiment. They should be allowed to experiment with safety and freedom from ridicule and so forth. And eventually they'll work out what's right for them because there are no pressures on them to move in one direction or another, and no doubt have made an appropriate, correct decision at, at the time. A lot of my peers who uh, grew up uh, during the heart of the age years used to have this kind of uh, terror of uh, contracting sexually transmitted infections and we used very um, stringent about the use of condoms as a result. I wonder now, now that HIV has become a more manageable condition, whether or not that's resulted in any complacency among younger people when it comes to the use of contraceptives. So um, there's no doubt that the very successful treatment that's available for HIV now has changed sexual behaviour. Absolutely no, no doubt. If you go back to the late 1980s, the early 1990s, it was an incredibly depressing time. Funerals, probably, were one of the biggest safe sex 
effective programs there were because you go to a funeral not only were you going to a funeral of a young person of 25 or 27 who died a horrendous death but in the congregation of that funeral were a whole lot of people not far behind they're very thin they had Kaposi sarcoma all over their face and so sexuality changed certain infections like syphilis totally disappeared from gay men completely but now HIV is a very treatable condition. In many circumstances, it's one pill a day. The life expectancy is near, is near normal. And so these things have changed. I wouldn't say that it's complacency so much as just um, a different force operating. But certainly, we must do whatever we can to encourage condom use as much as possible. I do think the fact that young people have to go to a supermarket to buy condoms or a chemist to buy condoms when they can't buy them from a vending machine in most places is just another example of the fact that we don't want to make those things ava too available because they might encourage people to have sex when all the data shows exactly the reverse. The more available you make condoms, the more they use. It doesn't increase people having sex at all. And that's just a process of the community maturing and understanding the issues so they can ask for those changes from their politicians. The past decade or so has seen a kind of a surge in the use of uh, sexual performance drugs like uh, Viagra. I wonder, um, you know, people are even using them recreationally in conjunction with other drugs like ecstasy and so forth. So I wonder, do, do drugs like Viagra have uh, a significant impact for the better or worse for sexual health? Viagra and the associated drugs are, are a tremendous benefit to the, com to the co community. So Viagra and drugs like that are of a tremendous benefit to the community. So they're very useful for people as they get older, they have some vascular disease and they need some help. But they're also used a bit by young people as well. So medically they're used for young people who might have erectile dysfunction or an inability to maintain erection because of psychological problems. They may feel some sense of embarrassment or rejection and they in the short term, these drugs in the short term, give that person the confidence to maintain an erection over time because anxiety is one of the strongest things that will get rid of an erection. But you're, you're right, they are used also in some other circumstances. Now in some situations they have benefit, in some situations they may not be so beneficial. So for example some drugs will make it more difficult for someone to get an erection. The fact they can use Viagra to get an erection will mean they can put a condom on when they previously couldn't put a condom on. So there are advantages and disadvantages in the use of those drugs. I don't think they're necessarily harmful. I think the balance of benefit is overwhelming. It seems that many of the issues that are surround sexual health, and I think you've alluded to this already so far, are kind of a, a site of conflict in terms of both morals and values. And I was wondering to what extent in this regard is sexual health socially as well as medically constructed? You're absolutely right that, that the social aspects of sexual health are enormous. And if you go back in time, they were, they were there for, for a reason. So the reason we have these, if you like, morals about what's appropriate and what's not appropriate was to prevent the spread of sexually transmitted infections, for example. Syphilis was, in the past, infected nearly a third of people in Europe before antibiotics. So there are good reasons to do something about it. Now we have treatment, now it's easy to control, now there's essentially no syphilis in heterosexuals at all. And so it's time for those sort of social issues to gradually be replaced by an analytical, sensible, evidence-driven basis for decisions. So for example, condoms should be widely available now because the more widely available they are, the less sexually transmitted infections there are. Contraception should be widely available because the more contraception is available, the less teenage pregnancies there are. Sex education should be more widely available for the same reasons. But fighting against that, of course, you have the various religious groups and conservative people. For example, the, the old abstinence-only policy in the United States. Abstinence won't work for something that we're biologically programmed to like. Now, we like eating. That's why so many people are overweight. We like having sex. So you can't just ask people to abstain from something that's biologically programmed. You have to put steps in place to minimise 
any infections or pregnancies or things that might happen as a result. So you're absolutely right. Social issues play a huge part as we gradually move along the path to a more evidence-based and effective programs to deal with some of the issues. So we've talked a little bit here as well about how people like institutional representations like the church have, um, have you know, perform a problematic role in the way that sexual health is perceived publicly. What other kind of uh, systemic blockages are there in order to identify the, and uh, manifest the kind of programs that we need to increase public awareness? Is there anything the government should be doing, for example, that they don't currently do properly? I, I think we, we can blame the government for things that they should be doing, but ultimately it is about people who vote in the government. And, and so the, the government, the, the, the permanent employees of the government, not necessarily the politicians, should be pushing so that the community as a whole understand the science, the logic, the reasons for why programs are effective and why things that they might intuitively think are going to be damaging or not. So providing accessible condoms, accessible contraception, education about relationships, about how you have satisfying sexual relationships and so forth. So the data exists to support those sort of programs, but we have to tell people about those programs so they can say to their local politicians, we would like you to do something to improve the sexual well-being of our community. So I think it's all about changing the, or educating the community about what works and what doesn't work and why it works and in a way minimising the influence of some of the powerful l lobby groups. For example, Italy is the centre of Catholicism but yet even though the Pope doesn't want you to use contraception, Italy has the lowest rate of children per couple in almost all of Europe at 1.4 children per couple, well below replacement. So, so people are voting with their feet, they are beginning to understand the issues and so forth and not paying too much attention to those particular individuals. But more progress will be made as the community is educated more about what works and what doesn't. Perhaps we can conclude on a kind of a practical note and maybe you could uh, tell us some of the services that are available here at the Melbourne Sexual Health Centre and some of the things that people could learn by being a bit more involved with uh, the resources that, that they already have access to. So Melbourne Sexual Health Centre is part of Alfred Health. It's a completely free service. It's, anyone can walk in. There aren't appointments. We see people on the basis of needs. So too many people come in a particular day. We'll see people who are more at need than others. They receive all their treatment investigations and uh, tablets all completely free of charge. And we tend to focus on those at highest risk of sexually transmitted infections which tend to be young people and um, men of sex with men. So they're the group that we focus uh, particularly on. At, at a community level what should people know about sexually transmitted infections? One, using a condom always prevents them. So it's terribly important to use a condom always. Secondly, they should know that if they develop any symptoms, they should present early to healthcare because they can get their investigations treated, usually not involving an examination, just involving some self-collected samples. And, and thirdly, things are very easy to treat, so you shouldn't be frightened or scared of these sort of things, they're very easy to treat. So, and the, f the final thing that Australia doesn't do very well is contraception, so condoms work well for the prevention of sexually transmitted infections. They're not ideal for contraception, so if people uh, feel that they're 100% protected using condoms for contraception, perhaps go and see their general practitioner and get some advice about other methods of contraception that are more effective. Christopher, that sounds like a great place to, uh, to finish our conversation. Some good practical tips on how people can demystify some of the issues around sexual health. Well, thanks very much for spending your time with us today. It's been my pleasure.